with Ryan. Today, we are learning basketball with Matt Eason. He is an NBA writer with Forbes, Opta Analyst, Fan Sighted, Sportscasting, and co host of The Media Pass with Alex at Alex Hoops. You can find his Twitter at Matt Eason 15. And he also covered the Pistons for the first time as a credentialed media member. Being mm-hmm. able to show up to the Pistons on media today, what, what was that like? And how are you, how are you doing today? Uh, today I'm doing well on Pistons Media Day. I was also, I was also doing well. Uh, it was fun. I think it's like one thing I've realized. I used to think that like working remote was like this amazing cheat code, um, life hack, and then you start doing it for like a couple of years, and you're like, you know, this is kind of isolating. Um, so being able to be in the arena, be around other writers all the time is really cool. Be around the players, you know, talk to coaches, pick their brain. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It's fun watching this team grow. It's fun watching the excitement around them kind of build up. I was there last night for the opener and it was cool. It was cool to be in the stadium. You know, I got to take notes on the game just like I always do, but um, it was, it was just cool just being in there in the arena. I definitely recommend it to anybody who's like in my position. Um, and thinking about doing a little bit more team-specific coverage. Yeah, there's nothing like a good opening day. I, I guess it's m- more of like a special day in baseball, but it definitely mm. hits hits that kind of way for basketball as well. Just being there when when every team thinks they still got a chance to do something yeah. special. And, and they haven't been hope. broken yet. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing but hope and, and potential being talked about around around the league so what was it like being at your first media day what what was the actual like media day all about or are you able to see and talk to a lot of players and coaches Mm -hmm. do you do you you know just you're covering probably for one of these outlets like i think it was forbes maybe for Mm -hmm. for that day so Mm -hmm. you know what what was that actually like um it's just i think it's getting comfortable with the players trying to build a repertoire with them get them more comfortable with your question your line of questioning it was a little nerve wracking at first, like trying to ask a question because you didn't know if you were asking something that you shouldn't ask. Um, but once you kind of like, I think if you're just, if you're sincere, you're, you know, you're very like thought, well thought out the question, but you're not trying to get something out of them. Like you're just more like curious. Like I think they'll, they're pretty, most players, most coaches that I've ever come across have been pretty, um, pretty honest, open you know, very responsive. You'll get like every once in a while, somebody who's just having a rough day and not really feeling it, but that's, that's human nature. Yeah. And I assume the, especially those first day, like first day of school vibes, like mm. no one probably wants to hop into anything too serious, no gotcha moments, but at mm. the very least talking some basketball, just, just getting started and, you know, hopefully talking about their expectations for the seasons and some of the development they got to work on in the off season. So, <clears throat> you know, could you kind of detail a little bit of your path in sports media? And, you know, you, you've been on this grind for years now on social media, building a profile, interviewing people, becoming a sports media journalist full time. And, uh, you know, for remote work to now be also being in person at, at the Pistons. So could you kind of touch on like what, what your path was like and, as well, maybe any advice to someone who's hoping to also pursue a similar field? Yeah. Um, so my path's a little bit unconventional, but I've come to realize that everybody's path in life is kind of unconventional. So I guess that makes it conventional by default. Um, but so I started out a couple of years ago. Uh, I was, it actually, I guess I start, I was in college. The only thing I ever wanted to do be an FBI agent, right? I thought I wanted to be in the FBI. Um, And then it was right around my junior year of college. I realized that uh, the only reason I wanted to be in the FBI was because I wanted to be like Batman. And I also thought that it would get me more more girls. Um, Neither of which I found out to be were true about the profession. And so then fast forward a little bit to my senior year, I actually got, this is like a little funny story, but I was, in line for position with secret service and uh, you know, the secret service is not too different than the FBI. And I realized that moment I'm like, I'm doing this for all the wrong reasons because I'm like, just because I don't get like the FBI windbreaker shouldn't be like a deal breaker like that. Like if I really cared about being in like, um, 
federal law enforcement. Like it wouldn't be a deal breaker if something so small as like the type of windbreaker I'd be getting on the job would be something that pissed me off. So I'm like, okay, you need a career change here. So then um, I went to law school. I mean, I studied for the bar, got into a law school, got into my alma mater actually. And I just remember the day I got into law school. Like I feel like for a lot of people, that's like a really big day. They're really happy. I was like super depressed to be honest. I was just really sad. I'm like, man, this kind of lame. Like success is not all that it's chalked up to be all this and that. And then, um, just kind of in a bad spot. Anyway, one of my hometown buddies, he was doing like a little podcast in his basement. And this guy actually, it's funny now he works for an NBA team himself. So he's, um, he's doing well, but he's doing a podcast in his basement. He asked me to come on. I had like so much fun doing it, talking basketball. And I, I didn't even really know that much, honestly, back then. Um, I just had so much fun talking about it. And I was like, I started like listening to more people that were like outside of like the main guys in the industry. I'm like learning about all these different people, like making a living doing this and stuff. And I'm like, so this is like a viable career path. And so I started, you know, trying to break into the space myself. I started this like podcast series. It was called Quest for the Best. And I interviewed a bunch of different people. I think it was like 67 media members, coaches, players. I just would cold call, cold email people, right? I sent like, and this is back to the um, the advice thing for those young people, like be ready to get some no's. Like I sent out like a thousand emails and I got like 60 yeses. That's like a, I don't know, what is it? A 6% hit rate or whatever. Like you're going to, you're going to get denied a lot in this yeah. industry. You just got to be cool with it. Um, you got to be okay with rejection. Is it like, it's not, it's not the NFL hall of fame. You know, you could throw 40 <laughs> interceptions. You just need one touchdown, man. So anyways, I did the podcast series. It really sucked. Um, looking back on it, you could probably find it on, uh, Spotify or Apple. It's called the quest. But it's really bad, really bad. Hell of a promo. I mean, people are flocking there right <laughs> yeah, after yeah, that. <laughs> but um, what I, the smart thing I did, though, was like, again, I was interviewing all the media members and stuff. And one thing about human beings, when you, when you interview them and let them talk about themselves and give their opinions and their takes, they're going to like you a lot more than they will like just the average Joe on the street, right? So eventually... I started trying to network with them. Um, I actually ended up getting to write an article for Raptors Republic, and then I parlayed that into an article for Basketball News, which used to be a burgeoning publication at the time. I know Nikaias Duncan used to write there. My buddy Jackson Frank, who was just on the show, used to write there. Uh, Mark Schindler, who was pretty big in the NBA space, now more of a WNBA guy, he used to write there. But So I started writing for Basketball News, and that's kind of when things started to go up and up. Um, I got the job at Forbes soon after I met, you know, opt analyst. Um, so I just started building my freelance portfolio and then you just keep getting on with these publications and you learn how to, um, manage the workload. And eventually, you know, you start making enough money where it's like, okay, I don't need to work. another. I, so honestly, I haven't worked. So I'm a little bit, um, privileged in the fact that, sorry, that's my dog. Um, he might be, I think, He's I think he just yeah, I think you saw him to share. hopefully he stops. But um, I've been privileged. Whereas, so that since the day I decided I wanted to pursue this field, I quit my part time job I had in college, and then during law school, I um, I, I was fortunate enough to be to not have to pay for my my law schooling because I got a I got a nice scholarship. So I was just doing this right, so not making any money at first, but putting like forty hours a week into it. Until I eventually did make a little bit of money and then I made a decent bit of money and then I eventually was able to get it to full time um, livable wages money towards the end of the law school thing so that when I graduated, I didn't have to worry about trying to play desk lawyer. But so I guess that brings me. So a couple of the, the key, the key elements of that story, right? I think the one is being OK with rejection, right? You got to, you know, you miss all you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. Um, two, it's. This job, dude, like people want it. Like it's a it's a desirable field. Like it's not, you know, it's not um not to poo-poo on any jobs, but it's not like underwriting at a insurance company. It's not they're not there's not like a million of these jobs, right? There's a few of them and you gotta work at it. And you have to be prepared to be working a lot more than you're making. Like I I've been treating this like a full-time job for four years, and I've only been getting paid like it's a full-time job for a year. 
So for three years, I was working more than I was getting. You know, for long for for one year, I went a full year without making any money on this. Okay, and it was working 40, 50 hour weeks, making no money. Right again, I had the privilege of you know coming from a nice family and having my schooling paid for and stuff. But still, like making no money is making no money. It's kind of hard to go out to the bar with your buddies when you have like you know a hundred dollars in your bank account and you have a tendency to get a little too drunk and spend that that kind of money when you're out at the bar. So. It's, it takes sacrifice. You have to be willing with that. If you're like a really big into the money kind of person and don't have that kind of patience, you know, it's probably not the field for you. And I think the other thing is just like, you know, networking is, is very corny um, to me. Like I, I always see people at summer league who are like just super like scatterbrained, anxious, like looking like, Oh, I got to talk to this person, that person I have to like maximize being here and all this. I don't, I don't uh, subscribe by that kind of networking. But I think like you should just like, first of all, we're all human beings on this earth. Like, just try to get to know as many people as you can in the industry and do it in a sincere way. Because if you do it in a sincere way, like just try to get them known because they're a human being just like me and you. Eventually, like something's going to come up and they're going to be like, uh, you know, hey, like I'm, this guy's really cool. He knows what he's doing. Good work. Like, you know, why don't you, here's this opportunity, you know, like, um, for example, recently I was um, asked to be a brand ambassador with basketball reference, um, you know website I've been using my entire life. But the reason was because one of the brand ambassadors is just like a good buddy of mine. Like we text um, all the time, just talk about random stuff. You know, I know him, he knows me. Like I know what his personal life's like. He knows what my personal life's like. And he's just like, Hey, do you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, why not? That wasn't like me trying to leverage his, uh, our professional relationship into uh, future opportunities. It was just like, you know, like he's, he's obviously likes basketball. I like basketball. Let's be friends. And then I'm sure like if you make enough friends in the field, like it'll work out for you. So I think that's the three main takeaways. Be okay with somebody saying no to you, make friends in the space, but do it sincerely. And then you just got to grind. You got to grind. You got to keep working on your craft, just like the players on the court are. No doubt. That's all great advice. And I can definitely relate to some elements of, mm-hmm. of that, that path and, you know, trying to, break through myself and in some mm-hmm. ways just trying to also kind of turn this into some full-time work and, and pursue that kind of grind as well. So I definitely appreciate what, what you've gone through and, and the work you put in and, and how you, you made it to where you are feeling comfortable and able to really just focus on the work and, and, and focus on getting better every day. And like you said, the, the grind stacking days almost just like the athletes out there. Um, so you know what? When you are writing stories and when you are interviewing players or, or coaches or whoever it may be, I know you got to interview. It's your cover photo I'm looking at here with the Mac with Oh yeah, uh, it, it's Chay. Oh, okay, he's in the profile picture there. The yeah. Rich and Darius Miles. I was yeah. going to say that was that was definitely a cool cool interview to get. They have a, a, a super fun podcast as well together with with uh, where they interview players all the time, but. So like when you're preparing for an interview like that or, or really anyone, you know, what's going through your mind as an analyst trying to either think of a topic for an article or think of questions for an interview? Like what, what, what kind of notes are, are you trying to hit when, when you talk to, to folks in the industry? Yeah, um, that's a good I, I don't know why. I've always been lucky in the fact that like once I, so, I mean, most of these interviews, they're, they're they're given to me. I, like, I'm not going out to get them. Right. So there's like, Hey, like we have this situation, like, you know, Darius and, um, Darius and, and Q rich were um, trying to tell the story about like the changing media la- landscape and all this stuff and how more players are involved. And so from there, it's like, okay, so you're probably going to get 15 minutes with them. It's usually about enough time for five to eight questions. So just come up with like five to eight questions that like, how would you like, cause the end of the day is like, so me and you, um, this, the, the Q rich story is a little bit different cause it's more narrative based, but like, if we're like, say I'm interviewing, um, I'm trying to think of the last time I interviewed like, a, like Tristan De Silva, I interviewed him, right. Orlando magic forward a couple months ago, I scouted his game beforehand and like, you know, me and you've been doing this for a long time. We scouted a lot of players. Like I could, I, I know his game like pretty well. I could, I could write it like one of my analysis articles. Right. But like the thing is people it means more when it's his words than mine. Like if I tell you like, you know, he's a great at attacking closeouts and good nail defender and all this and this and that, like, you're like, okay, cool. Like so could like 300 other people tell me that. But like 
when he talks about it, it's like this really cool thing, right? So, um, so I'm trying to figure out myself, I'm like, asking myself, like, how can I ask him questions that'll make him not like leading the witness, but like get him to say the quotes that I already know. Like the answers, I like, how can I get him to say what I'm thinking? You know what I mean? So it's like, and these things are true. Like this is his game. Like it's not, it's just objectively how he plays the game of basketball. I'm just trying to get that out of him. Right. Cause it'll sound so much cooler if he says it than if I say it, you know? Right. And you know, like you probably are going in thinking, you know, he, he has some killer off ball movement is mm. the cutting action. Mm. So like, how can you get him to, you know, just talk about his strengths without mm. just kind of feeding him the question and saying it yourself. So I'm sure trying to find that balance and getting getting the interviewee to kind of illustrate their thought process and more so like not just what they're good at but you know how or why they're good at it and what they're what they're thinking during those those actions so you know I'm I'm sure that that goes into it as well and then the same type of idea with you know when you're writing a story and watching film as an analyst like is there mm anything that you're looking for maybe when you're scouting players, scouting prospects, looking at teams where, you know, you're, you're trying to see X, Y, and Z from this team or this player to know like, okay, I think he can make it to the next level or, okay, I, I see what the, the point of this action was. Yeah. So I can't remember. It's, is it called top down approach when you take like the numbers and then you try to break it down from there or is it bottom up approach? I can't remember which one it is. I think it's top down. But I, I try to take more of a top down approach when I'm solving the, cause this is just like, like, you know, Michael Lewis said it once in a famous uh, Shane Battier article, basketball is just a problem to be solved. Right. All right. And so like, I look at like, um, so I'd say like, so it's a little bit easier to do this once we have like a larger sample size in the middle of the season, but like, say like the Orlando magic, right. It's Orlando guy say like three months from now. And I'm sure you're praying. It doesn't look like this, but like, I look at their offensive defensive rating. I'm like, okay, so second in off- um, defensive rating, 23rd in offensive rating. Like what's going on here, right? So I start to, you, you, see, you see that, you have that baseline, right? And the numbers don't always tell the full picture. You know, there's stuff you could look at maybe. Um, maybe they just have like some poor three-point shooting luck or whatever, injuries, whatever. But anyway, so if it's, if it's truly like a re- um, representative of who they are as a basketball team, I'll go and I'll start like looking and watching. I'm like, okay, so on defense, like what's going on here? Like, how are they this good of a defense? Is there something, are they just getting a lot of opponent shooting luck? Is this something that's personnel based? Is it scheme based? Right. So you try to answer that question. Then on offense, you do the same thing, right? You try to figure out the answer to the question. Like, why are they so bad? Um, And of course, to really, truly answer that, you have to watch the other teams to have somebody to compare them to. But so, yeah, you just kind of try to, you take the numbers and then you use the film to answer to figure out how those numbers got to be the way they are. At least that's how I've been trying to go about it recently. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, either, either way in that order of operations works, like sometimes you notice something on, mm-hmm. on the tape and, and you want to see if the numbers back it up and, and that's how you find your answer and, and kind of maybe you track it on, on the film. It's happened three or four times. Let's see if the numbers are true, or maybe I've just caught the four times they made this shot or, or mm-hmm. the, that it actually worked. And, you know, that's, that's a great way to find the balance in that. And, you know, I like how you transitioned to the magic for me where, where you went a little viral with magic Twitter uh, oh, talking God. about like Franz, talking about Paulo saying, you know, to, to talk about his game. So I, I got to follow up with that and see, see where you're at. Cause I actually ended up writing a little bit about it too. And mm-hmm. I think the, if I remember right, the, the general point was like, taking a lot of tough mid-range shots as your main scoring hub can be really difficult to be consistent compared to every other way to score the basketball and every other way to create good shots. So, you know, I think the what Magic fans are hoping for is that he is that tough shot maker consistently. And that's kind of like the back and forth is like the, he's taking star shots, but is he a star on efficiency and volume yet? And will he get there by taking these shots, getting this experience, and will that translate to the next year? Or is it just kind of like hoping it works, hoping it's enough? So so where are you at with, with Paulo and his future stardom? Obviously, he had a killer game last night. I'm not sure if you were able to catch it. Mag- magic Heat, uh, the Magic, from what I tracked, had like 55 stops in the game. Mm. And 
like 10 of those um, kill plays, which is three stops in a row, which is something Joe Vare came up with. Shout out to him. Um, but like the defense was just unreal, as expected, adding, adding KCP. Paulo was hitting threes. Franz was hitting threes. So it, it was just one of those nights where everything looked right. And they actually shot more threes last night than they did in any game last season. So hopefully with 49. So hopefully that is a sign of things to come, that at least they're going to get the threes up because that, that was a big X factor last season that, that just never went their way. So, you know, hopefully that is a sign that, you know, through Paulo's creation, through Franz's creation, we're going to get good shots every time down the floor for, for somebody, whether it's them or, or not. So where are you, you at on Paolo these, these days? Is he still, you know, the, the, the star of the future for the Magic, or are you leaning that, that maybe it's Franz? So it's funny, you know, we talked about this before the show started. Um, I was trying to, because I was at the Pistons game last night. And for me, like you watch so many games throughout the year, like you want to, you want to try to watch as many as you can without going to score as possible. Like it really, it gets, I love basketball, but it gets a little old watching every game and knowing what the final score is at the end before you even start. So I was trying to avoid all the games yesterday. Right. And this morning, um, I woke up to all these like replies um, on a Apollo article I'd written. Oh, like, there clown, it is. Clown, <laughs> there it is. clown, clown, clown. The magic like, fans are coming well, out. I'm like, okay, so well, thanks for that. Like <laughs> the magic one. Then now I know. <laughs> um, so I was really looking forward to watching that game. I probably won't watch it now. Um, so I'll have to wait until the magic's next game. But the other confession I have to make here is I have not, and this is because I have not watched Orlando Magic basketball since Game 7 against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Outside of the historical 2009 Magic yeah. series that I watched um, over the understandable, summer. Understandable. Understandable. Last game of the season, and you know it's just preseason before that. I don't so watch preseason basketball. Yeah, yeah, I don't watch preseason basketball. That's fair. But yeah, I have heard. I heard your boy. Your boy's taking a leap. Hey. He looked, he looked, <laughs> he looked pretty good. Um, in the preseason, and you know, if that's the truth, I'm like I have no, I gain nothing from from being a Palo hater. I lose nothing. <laughs> um, if I if I retract my statement, so like if it's if he's like better than you, like like I think me and Magic fans like pride didn't realize like they, I don't think they understood like how little of a disconnect we had between how we valued him. Like I thought Palo like a top forty, top fifty player last year. I think they probably thought he was like a top 25. I'm like, you know, what's, what's really – that's not that much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. There's like 450 players in the league. Um, but, I mean, if he's – like if he's if he just is better than he was last year, which very well could happen considering he's like 21 years old, um, then I'll be more than happy to walk back anything I said about him. I, I, I still don't like I still stand, I still stand by the fact that like – this guy for two years, we've seen him take pull up jump shots and be like a thirty five percent mid range shooter, and then all of a sudden it's like sixty percent for a playoff series. I'm like, okay, that probably won't last forever. Um, right. I still will stand by that, but I mean, if he lo- if he looks better this year, I'm super excited to see it. I think uh, I think they have a nice little thing going there. Um, yeah, I just wish that I wish they would trade for trade for like a little guard, like an Anthony Simons or a, a Darius Garland, but. That's neither here nor there, I guess. Yeah, that was a big hope over the summer that, that we might see some offensive infusion. And once again, they're kind of going with the internal development side of things, seeing if Jalen Suggs can handle a little more full-time point, putting Anthony Black in that role as well. Anthony Black is someone who's really impressed as, as the point guard of the second unit and filling in when, when Suggs was in a little foul trouble even last night. He's really sh- probably shown the biggest improvement just it's it's just preseason but like even summer league and preseason they're you know they're they're not nba games but they're they're the games we got for to evaluate like at the very least does this guy stand out among this group of players to see maybe if he will earn a little more burn come nba time and anthony black's the one that did so you know that that's kind of the where we're at with the point guard hopes because I, we've been asking for a, a pull-up three-point assassin type point guard to to be in Orlando for for what feels like years now, just to pull some guard, pull defenders out on the perimeter, get get them to stop ducking under screens, and just get them to create a little more space, shooting gravity wise at the top of the key, and create some open lanes for Paulo and Franz off the ball. So, you know, we'll we'll see if it finally happens, and it's it's not off the table, but 
Orlando does have plenty of like tradable contracts and good players on those contracts. So like it, it could always happen at some point. And the, the quote that Weltman always says is like, we're, we're not against improving this team at any point. If, if that's what we think will, will help the team long term. Like we're not really stuck on anyone or anything. He's not like, other than I would imagine Franz and Paolo are pretty safe, but like, other than that, I'd, and you would think Suggs, but who knows? It took a little bit for the, him to get that extension as well up to the last minute, but he did get it. Got 150 mil over five years. So, you know, we'll, we'll see if they pursue it. And, yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, I even wrote about it too as a follow-up to your piece just to kind of, like, console Magic fans a little bit of what, what you were trying to say. And, like, you know, small sample size versus the large sample size says that this is likely to not last for the entire playoff run and that it's, it can be really hard for that to be your consistent number one scoring option where he's taking tough shots every play. Like you're asking him to be Kevin Durant or Kawhi and maybe he's not there yet as a second year player, but like, you know, maybe down the line, especially if he shoots better this season, maybe he gets to that point where that is his main scoring option. And he's also efficient on it on high volume and he's creating for others. I think the, ideal place for the magic to be is not just asking Paulo to score every time down 30 tough shots a game, but running offense through him, through Franz to create good looks for the team and, and kind of spread the wealth because, you know, they, they swapped out KCP for Fultz essentially and moved Gary Harris down a peg. So now you have pretty much good three point shooters at, at every position or at least capable spacing around these guys other than a few guys on the third string, I guess. Um, so, you know, better shooting around these these star creators hopefully creates a little more balance when it comes to the offense. So hopping around here to some of the sports casting work that you've done, I thought we might bounce around the league a little bit. You've been working on the sports casting kind of group projects here where – you and Ez and Ben and Jackson all like take a team, ask some questions of what you're you're wondering heading into the season. So I thought we might explore some of them. We got the Nuggets, the Blazers, the Heat, and the Warriors on deck here to kind of bounce around. Um, unless you wanted to start with anyone in particular, I thought we might hop on uh, the Nuggets first, where you know you were wondering what a lot of us are wondering: Are these young guys ready to contribute now that KCP they're ideal fifth starter role player is no longer there and i have my thoughts but i, w- I want to hear yours first yeah again i didn't watch any preseason so I'm, i've heard i've heard really good things about julian strother and i think he's gonna have to be the guy to, to fill in kcp shoes i think christian braun is a very good defender he's battle tested he's been around the block now but he's he's like a below average shooter for his position. And it's so hard to shed that reputation once you've given, been given the label. Like it's not like people are always like, if you could just get to um, 37% on three attempts per 100, like that's perfect. I'm like, no, 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 no. You gotta, once they, once they say you're a non-shooter, you've got to be spraying the ball and you've got to be hitting like 30, you gotta be taking like eight, nine attempts per 100 um threes and still hitting like 37 38 percent before the defense is like okay we got to switch something up you know and i just think like how many players in the last 10 years have we seen successfully been able to shed that label not many whereas like strother comes in and he's already got great shooting indicators incredible free throw shooter great touch in the short mid-range took the second most threes on a per possession basis out of any rookie in his class last year outside of jordan hawkins who's another certified marksman and I mean, the things I like about Australia, other than that, he's got some ball skills, can handle in the pick and roll a bit, some floater game. Passing is going to need some time, but he's already got like a solid baseline with the handle. So that can improve the more and more he kind of gets comfortable in those situations. And then I really like his size. He's six foot seven with a six foot nine wingspan, pretty good for the two guard spot. He, if you watch his tape from last year, like he's always in front of his man, always in the right spot. It's just not really super physical. Um, and I think I'm okay with that at this point because he's young. And if you look like, if you go back and watch like KCP when he was his age, he also struggled with some physicality. 
And the cool thing about Strother is he's not like a burst guy. He's not really super aligned on his first step. So if he does start to add on a little more size and loses a little bit of speed, it's not that big of a deal because it's not a huge part of his game to begin with. Right. He's definitely a guy that, that could pop. And, you know, he, he, he was a good kind of offensive option in college. And we'll see kind of how he translates to that role. And you mentioned Christian Braun. There's, there's Peyton Watson. Some some energetic young guard defenders there that, that bring some length and I don't know if he'll get much playing time this year but I I'm a big fan of Trey Alexander from Creighton I mm-hmm. think he's a guy that can kind of plug and play as he, he can kind of fit to whatever role they ask of him because he can defend a little he can score a little he, he can dribble pass and shoot if they just want him to be kind of an off ball guy so I'm probably in the minority on this part and I, I think I mentioned that with Jackson too where I think the KCP maybe it's not the minority, but the, that the KCP subtraction will hurt them in the playoffs because you're, you're missing your main guy point of attack defender to stop the other team's best guard. And everyone's got a, a star guard that you got to slow down. And you're asking a lot of young guys to replace that. So that, that I think is where it's going to cost them versus the regular season. I don't know if it's going to hurt them that much. Like I think they're, they still got the top four core guys that fit perfectly together. They have plenty of options here they can throw out to see who fits best with that unit. And Jokic is just so good, and the, their top four is just so good that I kind of think they're they're still a fifty win team. They they won they were the tied for the first seed last year at like fifty seven wins I think. Like I I think they're still very easily capable of winning fifty even fifty five games again. But then maybe like I said maybe it comes to back to haunt them in the playoffs when when you. It, everything shrinks and every single flaw and weakness gets focused on. And that's when they might miss KCP the most. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a good take to have. Um, I, I'm, I'm still worried about them obviously. And I just don't, it's just hard to find a role player. That's that good. Like KCP was one of the best role players in basketball. You know, those guys aren't walking through the front door every day. So it'll be interesting to receive for sure. I think, I think, all those guys you mentioned are, are going to be important, but I really think Julian Strawler is going to be very important. I, also, I thought Daron Holmes was going to be really helpful for them, um, like a more athletic version of Dario Saric, kind of a little backup center minutes, but obviously I just hope he gets better soon. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we might as well just hit like one, one question, hit your themes of this sports casting article. So why don't we bounce around to the Blazers, who – you know, you, you talked about their young core and kind of figuring out who, who is this team actually building around? Like, who, who is the most important, vital franchise cornerstone on the roster? Is it on the roster? Or is it maybe the, the upcoming draft class or two? Is, is it in that class? And, and they're just kind of waiting until that, that time ticks off and they, they get to select their next guy. Yeah, I was. Um, I actually watched Blazers Warriors this morning, and the first quarter they started really strong. And I'm like, man, this team so long, so many athletes, such a good defense. Like, who's going to score on them? And then I start start watching their offensive execution, and I'm like, okay. And now I remember why I had them as like the second worst team <laughs> in the Western Conference heading into the season. But um, yeah, I think I think the re- the way like. It's kind of like the, you know, the like the seven steps of like acceptance or whatever <laughs> of grieving. It's like, so with rebuilding, it goes like, first, you got to realize you're bad enough to, um, to need to rebuild. Right. And then you got to sell off all the assets. So then you got to just start accumulating, hoarding young talent. Right. And then the next part is figuring out what young talent's actually worth making into a core. Um, and then you can move on to like, you know, trying to get guys while your young talent's still on rookie deals big deals so they can like maximize all the cap stuff and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, so yeah, I mean, I think this year's like, you have all these young guys, like now it's like, who's the ones that actually are like good and who are the ones that are just kind of good in theory. Um, I love, I'm like the, the number one head of the Tamani Kamara fan club. Like nobody loves that guy more than I do. I, I think he's awesome. Um, but he's also very flawed, right? Offensively, especially as a shooter, like he'll never be, he'll probably never be like an average above average shooter. For the same reasons as Christian Braun, Scoot Henderson, he had a rough rookie year, but he had some some nice moments in that first half. I was pretty impressed with. He's still kind of um, 
some weird movement patterns. Um, not as fluid of mover as I was envisioning when I heard about him in his pre NBA days. Anthony's there. He's kind of always been in the trade talks. Same with uh, Jeremy Grant, DeAndre, and then you got guys like Clint again. Like what's like? I mean, he's huge. He's kind of kind of moves like Zach Eady. Not as good of an offensive player, but a better defender version of Eady. Like a Shaden Sharp, nobody can really tell how good that guy is because he's like a super athlete, but we haven't seen him play basketball in a year. Um, you know, we can do this, we can do this all day, but it's, I think it's just like this year you want to kind of pinpoint who those like three, four guys are that you really want to build around. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, does any one stand out to you that you think is, is clearly a part of this core going forward or is it, is it just projects across the board? I, I, I don't know. It's hard for me because I don't, I'm not big on Scoot or Shane Sharp really up to this point. I think, I mean, they could definitely change my mind this season with how they play. Yeah. Um, I love me some, love me some, like I said, Tumani Kamara, Denny of the, uh, I just don't know with Denny how well he fits the timeline. I guess he's still pretty young. Isn't he like younger than a uh, Dolan connect or something? Isn't he some status? <laughs> he, he could be. That, yeah. Connect yeah. Is, so, he's up there. As a, yeah. As he's a up there in age. So yeah, I think I like, I mean, the two that I probably like the most are Denny and Tumani, but I also have like an affinity towards like big forwards who can't shoot. So. That's fair. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of interesting prospects. I kind of like you. I mean, I, I was a big fan of Scoot's potential with mm-hmm. it, that first step burst. I mean, I thought he was a worthy top, top type of a pick, obviously not over Wimbenyama, but in that top draft range uh, for everyone else. And, you know, he's an, it brings explosiveness and it, it just hasn't really translated to the league yet, whether it's whether the league's moving too fast for him and just needs to slow down a little bit so he can actually process when to use that explosiveness and that speed a little more maybe that's the next step for him but i would think he's the guy of all of them that they would you know have the most stock in it for the future but you know maybe he's he's got to show it and otherwise kind of like uh, i teased before was maybe it's just someone in the next couple drafts is is really who they end up building around because they if they have a top pick in the cooper flag draft or the cam boozer aj devonsa draft Darren Peterson draft. I mean, there, there's a lot of top talent coming in the next few years here with Tyron Stokes or Tyron Stokes the, the year after that. So, I mean, there, there's a, a lot of exciting prospects that, you know, may, they've kind of gotten tanking mostly out of the game, but in, in terms of it being super obvious maybe, but, you know, it's, it's definitely some guys that, that might be worth taking a, a future or taking a season for to set up your, your future decade after that. So. You know, shout out. Uh, he's not, you know, Rob Williams as well is is a heck of a defender. He's like they they have a lot of good talent, but it's kind of like the Pistons where it's like, all right, you have talent on the paper, but do they fit together? Are you what are you building for the future? Who are you building around? Obviously, Detroit has has Cade as kind of a nucleus, their guy, but you know, it's it, it's got to be more than just talent. Like it's got to be good basketball players that that fit together and kind of can actually develop and grow together instead of just hoping you throw a bunch of talent and that it sticks. So, you know, we'll, we'll see who they end up kind of investing in. I think Klingon as well is, is like a, a fine starting big prospect in this league. Like, like none of these guys really jump out as like franchise cornerstones, but like mm-hmm. potential, you know, starters on, on good teams if, if things go the right way. So, you know, it's, um, you know, and, and they do have some resident kind of, I wouldn't even call them veterans because they're still relative young, but Jeremy Grant, he has bounced around the league a little bit and he's a, a borderline like star type of player on that, or at least he was on, on that contract. And Anthony Simons, super exciting scoring type prospect who doesn't seem to be a part of their future, but seems to be their best guard at the moment. So, you know, we'll see kind of if they maybe cash in for some more picks with some of these other guys and, and just keep taking on new talent until they find the right guy. So, you know, speaking of the Warriors, they did play last night. We caught their games a little bit this morning. I, I watched a little as well. And, you know, you asked a simple question, do they still have their fastball? And they lost Clay Thompson, obviously. They replaced him kind of, you know, money ball. We're going to build him on the aggregate. We're going to we're gonna get DeAnthony Melton for the defense. We're going to get Buddy Heald for the offense. And we're just going to see – if we can re- recreate Clay Thompson in the ag- aggregate like that, so are are they, 
you know, are they still a contender with, with Steph? Yeah, unfortunately, that philosophy doesn't work as well in basketball because you can only play five guys at a time. Um, you can't <laughs> right. play like eight or nine dudes and be like, okay, I'm going to use him when we need to play defense and him when we need <laughs> yeah. shooting. But um, I think with the Warriors, I think like you showed yesterday, super deep, really deep team. You got like 12 guys you can play, legit play basketball. Um, I would Tracy even say Jackson like, Davis. Not, yeah. not to interrupt, but Tracy Jackson Davis, and, and another exciting young player mm-hmm. we got in the front court versatile defender who could, who could have a bigger role this year yeah so like you have 12 guys who could like you know i wouldn't even scoff the notion you could say that they could all play playoff minutes right like you could trust them to play like at least eight ten minutes playoffs it's like a think of it like a boxer like you know, they are they could do all these different types of punches right they have a jab they have an uppercut they have um i don't know i don't really box that often so i don't know all the types of punches. but you know they have everything right but the question is can any of those punches knock anybody out you know like how what is do they have like a five-man lineup where they like put them out there and they're like death line you know do they have a death line so i think that'll be the interesting question something to monitor throughout the season last year they were they were really really good and really um outscoring teams when they played with curry pajemski wiggins kuminga and, and green i didn't see any yesterday uh in that Portland game of green at the five so that'll be something interesting to monitor is that something they're kind of putting in their back pocket for now they want to wait until they need to rev it up to that next gear um but yeah they'll be it'll definitely be a fascinating watch yeah and that's you know always been a question with green is like it it seems like they set the tone as the whole reason small ball even really became a term is because Mm -hmm. of those lineups with draymond at at center with forwards two forwards and two guards and draymond at the top playing like five out through him or and letting the the big man be a kind of a playmaking hub at the top but that's asking a lot of him to do the dirty work of the traditional center and it, it kind of runs through his body through the regular season to ask him to be a full-time center and a full-time playmaker every game for 82 games so that's probably you know, like you mentioned, why they might save it for 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 bigger matchups, or, or just save it in general for the playoffs. But I think that is kind of in their back pocket of at least a lineup they can go through. But you know, do they have enough of a rotation? I mean, it doesn't seem like they have too many bigs on this roster to begin with. It, it's a lot of guards and, and wings around Draymond at the moment. So you know, it's I, I think Steph is still Steph, and the contract they gave him kind of makes you think they're still going for it around building around Steph. They have definitely have some interesting players, uh, p- players and acquisitions. Like I, re- I really like the D- D- Anthony Melton pickup. Like I, I think he's a really versatile, strong defender has, has shown a little bit of pick and roll juice kind of as like a more of a secondary option off the bench, not like your lead guard, but like can, can score a little bit, can do the dribble pass and shoot, can, can hit the three. So that's someone that, you know, should fit right into Warriors basketball. And then, you know, buddy is buddy. He, he can, he'll come and yell for seven threes one game and zero the next, but like, it'll be fun, fun watching him. And, you know, he kind of fits in to some of the splash bro mystique that they, they got going there. So, you know, can they, they got 12 options. Do they have an NBA rotation from that? Well, I guess we'll see. So do you, have any thoughts on one last team here, uh, the Miami Heat? Um, you said that you know how you would just simply ask how good are they? They've been kind of near the bottom of the playoff picture the last few years in terms of seeding, but then they're one of the most feared playoff teams in the whole league because they just constantly make these deep runs and knock off these other teams that are ranked a little higher than them, even making the finals a handful of times. I, uh, as of late so it's like you know who what will they be this year they they just added Khalil Ware who's a super skilled center like super brings a lot of length and and height and kind of to either pair with Bam or bring up off the bench behind Bam Bam himself had a killer Olympics where he started shooting threes so maybe we see a little more three-point volume from Bam Jimmy's one year older is is he still Jimmy I guess that's another question. And then, like, they have plenty of names that pe- people around the league would recognize with Kevin Love, Josh Richardson, and Alec Burks, and obviously Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero. So their their big move was almost last season with Terry Rozier to bring him in, have another scoring option who could light it up. And um, 
uh, I'm going to butcher his name, but Jamie Has- Hackwez, or Jackwez, I, I, I should I should know I mean, that. How many hack is? Yeah, ha, ha, I, mean, I guess I haven't said this one out loud in in a long time. But how many hack was close enough? His he, he was he was killer. I'm trying to compliment this man. He he was a killer scorer last year. Really unique type of scorer too, where you just don't necessarily see his play style too often. He came out of the gates scoring really nice. And then Jovic is a really interesting prospect who didn't play too great yesterday, but you know, super interesting offensive prospect, especially. So what what do you make of this team? Are, are they right where they have always been, kind of mit- hitting around the eight seed, but ready to make a deep playoff run uh, at any given moment? Yeah, I mean, basically, it's funny to say this because, like, they were – people have been calling them Golden State Warriors of the East for the longest time, and that's mostly because, like, the actions they run and stuff. And both teams have, like, these brilliant head coaches. But I would say they're kind of, like, in terms of roster build, are similar to Golden State this year. You have a lot of, like, dudes – Right, guys, I can just trust to give me like eight to ten minutes in a playoff game. But what is their best five man lineup? Like, who, like, does Jimmy Butler have like another crazy Butler playoff run in him? Um, does Bam have another gear he can get to offensively while also kind of maintaining his incredible, you know, all world defense? How much better can a guy like Hame Hawkins get? Do they have enough, like, you know, between the two guards in terms of rim pressure and then also like perimeter defense? Um, between Rozier and Hero, it's just like it's it's a weird thing again. It's like, can do they have? Will they figure out like a five man blend that's kind of like whatever plus ten per one hundred possessions um, when they're all on the court, or are they just kind of like a bunch of dudes? They piecemeal things for the eighth seed. You know, they give like the first round series like a hard time, maybe make them a little bit tired for the the semifinals, but nothing more than that. So that's kind of like I'm basically watching the Warriors in the Heat. In very similar ways. Yeah, and so you know, la- lastly here, out of all these teams, obviously not Portland as much, but you know, who who do you think? I mean, the Nuggets have the better chance of everyone still being a little farther along, but you know, between the Warriors and the Heat, like who who do you think could actually do, do? Either of them have a real shot to to win the playoffs? So they can probably make it, but do they are they pretenders or contenders at this point? I think the Warriors have a better chance just because you have, I mean, Curry can explode. He can erupt. And we know Butler can too, but like with Butler, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. just because he shoots a lot of twos and a lot of fouls. It's a lot more of a grinding eruption, right? It's kind of like, like you, 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 Jimmy Butler never has like a quiet 30 point game. Like you hear and feel all 30 of those points. Whereas Curry's like kind of like dancing around, you know, three here. Like last night he had like the most quiet like triple double. And I was like, when did this guy even grab a rebound? Like, I've been watching this game, you know. I, I like to think I pay attention when I watch the games. I'm like, when did he when did he get an assist? Like, how does he have a triple double right now? You know, it's so silent assassin y. Um, so you have that. And then I just think the Warriors have a better chance of unlocking like lineup balance because they don't have their two best players both being like non three point shooters, which like hamstrings you in terms of like roster construction. And also they have more young talent that could erupt this season, right? I didn't like what I saw from Kuminga in his debut game against the Trailblazers. That's just one game, but he has a chance to erupt. You have Pajemski, you have um, Trace Jackson Davis, and the the Heat have these guys too, but like the Warriors guys are kind of more proven. And especially a guy like Pajemski, I think just has a lot more upside than anybody on the Heat in terms of the young guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, they they might be around the same seating in their respective mm-hmm. conferences, but you know, I th- I think the West top to bottom probably remains a, li- a little stronger, and that they they have a few indicators. I like their best their roster better in general, mm-hmm. like for the reasons you mentioned. The star superstar is still a superstar, and um, you know, like you said, a lot of the young guys can pop. And just to hit on some numbers real quick, Miami had had the fifth best defense and the 21st best offense last year whereas golden state has the 15th best defense and the 10th best offense last year so generally a top 12 on both sides indicates a contender i believe Mm -hmm. every champion since the Shaq and kobe lakers have been top 12 on both sides unless that's changed at some point so that's at least a little bit of an indicator and point differential as well from last year is the warriors are 15th and the heat are 18th so that's can 
generally be an indicator for, for future success almost as much as the wins themselves from the year prior. So, you know, I, th- I think both are kind of lo- locked into the playoff race to at least hope like their goal is at a minimum miss that play in, secure mm. some seeding, and then, you know, hopefully make a run like both of them have so many times in the past. But, you know, I, th- I want to thank you a lot for taking the time today. Love talking hoops. Always appreciate talking some basketball with you. You can check out Matt Issa's work at Forbes and Opt Analysts and Fan Sided. You got to head up his podcast, The Media Pass, and just check out, take, take a read and, and read some of his articles. Then check out the Pistons this year with, with his coverage. So, you know, appreciate you taking the time today, Matt. Of course, man. It was awesome to see you, RK. Uh, we should do this again soon. It was, ni- it was nice to join. It was nice to help you complete. Well, you haven't. I don't watch uh, the Avengers, so <laughs> what is it called again? The uh, the stones, the yeah, uh, the, we were co- the Infinity Stones. We the were collecting the Infinity Stones. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're more to podcast, so we we gotta hunt down Ben for a pod. The, the listeners are are waiting, you know. So I'll, I'll hit up Ben here. We'll we'll have to make it happen. Awesome, I appreciate man. you taking the time, man. Yeah, have a good one, RK. You too. Later. Learning Basketball is a Swish Theory podcast, hosted from Beyond the RK. Hey, that's me. You can find my work on Twitter, YouTube, Substack, and check out the team's website, theswishtheory.com.